True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. By the time Sanford Clark was brought to this murder farm here, he'd already been in his uh, uncle's company for several weeks. He'd been kidnapped up in Canada and driven down here. At first, Sanford wasn't even believed until they started digging around in the chicken coops and coming up with human remains. The thing that got me captured here was his father, Sanford Clark, and the way he recovered from it. I may not have met Sanford Clark, but I've seen the trailer left behind, and part of it's in his son, Jerry, of a guy who just wants to honor his dad. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. A quick note before we get started. The team behind Missing Richard Simmons is back with an update and a whole new story. The series is called Headlong, Surviving Y2K. We all remember Y2K, right? The Armageddon that never happened. From an evangelical family preparing for the apocalypse to the coders who fixed the millennium bug, follow their stories through New Year's Eve 1999 and find out what happened at midnight. Plus, host Dan Taberski shares his own Y2K story. It's called Surviving Y2K, because Dan barely did. Find Headlong Surviving Y2K in your favorite podcast app and subscribe so you won't miss an episode. In 1928, agriculture and the movie industry were booming in Los Angeles. But a string of child abductions and murders in nearby Wineville changed the lives and views of the locals. Someone had kidnapped, sexually abused, and murdered at least three, and possibly as many as 20, young boys. From 1926 to 1928, teenager Sanford Clark was kept prisoner on his uncle Gordon Stewart Northcott's chicken farm in Wineville. He suffered unimaginable abuse and witnessed horrific acts by Northcott. Sanford's escape from the clutches of his abuser and his journey to live a life without violence is truly inspiring. His time on the farm was a living hell, and the stories he shared with the police were unlike anything they had heard before. Today we're talking about a dark part of history that most people were in a hurry to forget. As brutal and upsetting as the crimes of Stuart Northcott were, it is the resilience and the strength of Sanford Clark that makes this story something worth telling, and something that can stay with us as proof that good can prevail over evil. Today's beer is called Map of the Sun. I've often thought, wouldn't it be a good job to dream up beer names? Absolutely. This one I really like. Map of the Sun is brewed by the Rare Barrel in Berkeley, California. And it's a wild ale. See, I'm staying away from my PAs and stouts for the time being. So this beer is a straw-colored beer, big, huge, fluffy white head, and streaks of lace. Very pretty. Nice aroma. A lot of peach and apricot. Fresh peach and apricot. Maybe a hint of lemon. And it's got that tart, acidic kind of aroma. Then when you taste it, the first thing you pick up is kind of a biscuity taste, some lemon. Peach and apricot are both there, uh, but a little more subdued than you figured from the aroma. And it's still a nice tart one. It's a crisp, bubbly beer, one that I know you'll like. That's why I got it. Thank you. Let's open it up and give it a try. Okay. All right, let's go on down to the quiet end. That will just sit and relax. Why don't you get us started? So Sanford Clark was only 13 years old when he realized that his mother, Winnie, was going to send him away. Now, everything about the plan that was pitched to him sounded wrong, and he knew his mother and her brother, Stuart Northcutt, were lying to him and his father. But Sanford's mother was the boss, so whatever she said would be what would happen. The initial story was that Uncle Stewart would be taking Sanford on a road trip in his Buick to visit the city of Regina, which was about 150 miles southeast of where they lived, and it's the capital of Saskatchewan. Now, Sanford figured out pretty quickly this was a lie, and when he confronted them about this lie, Mom changed the story. She said Sanford's going to be traveling with his uncle to California. He's going to have an adventure there, and he's going to learn the value of a hard day's work. Sanford would be working on a farm with Stuart, and he would learn to be a chicken rancher. So this was all bullshit, right? Because Sanford thought that the second story they gave him was even less believable than the first. 
Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. neither of these stories. You know, here's, here's this kid, he's what, barely a teenager, who has lived a pretty sheltered life, and he's, here's what we're going to do with you? I mean, come on. Yeah, and plus, Uncle Stuart was this delicate 20-year-old who was an aspiring pianist. He wasn't a farmer. He lived all his life in Canada until two years before that, when he and his parents had left for the United States. And the whole family knew that his dream was to become a pianist. And as for living out in the desert, why would anyone move from a city like Los Angeles to live in the middle of nowhere, unless they had to? His uncle Stuart seemed both impatient and disappointed, because he'd made it clear for the entire two weeks of his visit there that he really wanted Sanford's younger brother, Kenneth, to go with him. He had worked hard to be persuasive, trying to get Winnie to let go of Kenneth. So Sanford was kind of like the consolation prize. It sounds like. You, you think that uh, Uncle Stuart had targeted his brother, Kenneth, first? That's, that's the one he wanted? That's the one he wanted. He was younger. Yeah. Don't you think that Winnie and Stuart's mother knew what kind of a person Stuart was? Yes, I think Stuart's parents and his sister knew who he was, and that's why she wouldn't give him Kenneth, because right. she liked Kenneth. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of a surprise, though, to the whole family that Winnie refused to give Stuart Kenneth because she'd always been willing to give Stuart anything he wanted, so much so that Sanford expected that he and his brother would both have to go with Uncle Stuart. But Kenneth was Winnie's favorite son, and she made no effort to hide her feelings about that. So she actually told her brother that he was asking too much of her when he asked for Kenneth. All talk of Stuart taking her favorite boy was over. Stuart would just have to make do with Sanford. So Sanford tried to protest and save himself, but Winnie's voice was very commanding and overbearing. Uncle Stuart tried to console him by talking about enrolling him in a local scouting program down in California to offer him some boyhood adventure and to help him with character development. And Winnie added that that might be just what he needed because she was always telling him there was something wrong with him. He just wasn't right. Yeah, he wasn't her favorite kid. No, she was very verbally abusive to him. Well, I think you could say even more than that. I mean, she was a crappy mother. Yes, she was a horrible mother. Just a horrendous mother. Well, of course, and this sending him away with Stuart really clinches that idea. Yeah, because she knows what's going to happen to this kid. I think she did, yeah, and she just didn't care. Nope. Now, Stuart said that he didn't think Sanford appreciated how the ranching experience would mold his character. You would have to toughen that boy up, he added. Now, he laughed out loud at that and then winked at Sanford's mother. But this time, though, Sanford's mother didn't laugh for long, which hit Sanford as very odd. Her expression changed when Stuart spoke of toughening him up. She looked away from Sanford. So this was so out of character for her that it gave Sanford a real sense of dread. Because I think she knew what was going to happen, and she just wanted to be in denial of it. Right. Uncle Stuart announced that their first stop in California was going to be to visit his parents in Los Angeles. Sanford remembered his grandparents, but he barely knew them. He felt better for a minute when his older sister, Jessie, gave him a hug. The hardest thing for him was to leave her behind. She had been his protector very often through the years, but there was nothing she could do in this situation. She wasn't old enough to be expected to take him with her and support them both, and Jessie was far too protective of him to ever agree that he could quit school and work just so they could escape the family home together. She was kind of like his surrogate mom, and I think she was only 17. She was. She wasn't much older than him. Right. So when Sanford and Stuart reached the U.S. border, Sanford just kind of stood back and watched all of this energy that his uncle invested into lying to the guards there. And part of the story to get Sanford over the border was something about Sanford being born in the U.S., but they'd lost his papers, and someone in their family was dying in a United States hospital. Uncle Stuart kept up this nonstop chatter at the guards while he wove one excuse into another, until it seemed that in the end, the officials just waved them across the border to get them out of the way. As soon as they cleared the border, they got into a pattern of driving through the day and then camping near the road at night. Uncle Stuart would take the car seat so Samford slept out in blankets on the ground. Now on this trip, Uncle Stuart talked a lot, and Sanford, if he didn't give the right answer that Stuart wanted or if he didn't answer quickly enough, Stuart would smack him in the head. Now, he hit him so hard, Sanford would later admit, that he nearly fell unconscious and he saw stars or flashing lights in his vision. So this is a good start, isn't it? 
Yeah, and I think it even went beyond that. I mean, I think he was nearly unconscious from some of these hits. Yeah. These were full force hits to the head. Now, by the time they did arrive at the home of Sanford's grandparents, 62-year-old George Northcutt and his 54-year-old wife Louise, Sanford was hoping that new people would improve Stuart's mood, which had been growing steadily darker over the past few days of the trip. Yeah, but as soon as they walked into that grandparent's house, it was clear to Sanford that things weren't going to improve. Grandma Louise ignored Sanford completely while she fell all over herself to welcome her son, and she burst into tears and buried Stuart in her arms, repeating, My precious boy, my precious boy, over and over again, and just totally ignoring Sanford. And this cut Sanford completely off guard. He'd really forgotten what his grandparents were like and how melodramatic she could be and how loud she was. So she waited on Stuart hand and foot, and she had his favorite tea brewing in the kitchen and passed him a bowl of his favorite candy. And the whole image here just seems sickening. As is portrayed, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So Sanford never knew anyone over age five who got so much attention. Grandma ignored her husband altogether until she pulled Grandpa George out of the best chair in the room and told her son to sit there. Uncle Stuart looked at his father and gave a shrug, then laughed out loud and sat down in the big chair. He leaned back and put up his feet. So we know who runs that household. Yeah, it really didn't take long for Sanford to realize that his grandparents' relationship really worked about the same way as his parents' relationship did. Grandma Louise was in charge, just like Winnie was. And Grandpa George was passively unhappy, just like Sanford's dad. He also seemed to be angry that Stuart had showed up with Sanford in tow. He acted the same way Sanford's father did when he was unhappy. He would just kind of remain detached and glowering as if he was like under a dark cloud, but there was nothing he could do about it. He seemed quite powerless. So Sanford kept as quiet as he could and tried to stay out of the way. But this attempt to conceal himself failed even before the first half hour had passed. Grandma Louise walked in front of Sanford so closely that she stumbled over his feet. It seemed to Sanford that she had done this on purpose. Grandma Louise blamed Sanford for tripping her, started calling him names and he ended up being thrown out of the house. He was told that the only reason he was along on this trip was so that he could help Stuart set up the farm. His grandma Louise also threatened Sanford, saying that if she saw just one callus on her son Stuart's gifted hands, there would be hell to pay. Remember, he's supposed to be a concert pianist. Yes. Sanford would be expected to do all the labor involved in setting up and running the farm. So having grown up in an explosive household, Sanford's learned response to irrational violence was just to placate his perpetrator. His survival instinct told him that if he allowed his Uncle Stuart to hurt him just a little bit, and then willingly humiliated himself before him, his uncle was less likely to hurt him any more after that. So Sanford retreated into the dime store detective novels that he had put into his suitcase before they left Canada, and he just remained careful to avoid any sudden movements, to make any eye contact. I mean, he's just walking on eggshells. Stuart told Sanford that he would make sure that he wouldn't run off. Sanford was just a useless boy whose family had put him out, Stuart said. He was an illegal immigrant in the U.S. also. And Stuart added sexual abuse to the physical abuse while they were in Los Angeles. He began by knocking Sanford senseless to the floor and then putting his mouth all over him while he masturbated. And things got worse, and we're not going to get into a lot of details but it was just horrific stuff. Yeah, I'm glad we're not getting into details. No. It's horrible. But he committed acts that Sanford hadn't even heard of before, and then he left Sanford feeling really ashamed and sick. He didn't know what to make of it. No, he's this little, naive 13-year-old. Right. And jeez. So when Sanford and Stewart left Los Angeles and arrived in Wineville, Sanford wondered how anybody could use the word ranch to describe the three acres they had set aside for raising chickens. The property had a well with a pump inside of a useless wire fence. Grandpa George had arranged for construction crews to begin work on the small farmhouse, and Sanford was expected to help with anything they needed around the place. In the meantime, he and Stuart would live in a tent and build chicken coops, stocking them with birds and getting the business started this is going to be a chicken farm for eggs. Okay. Okay, it's not a, not a farm for 
eating chickens. Okay. We're, we're keeping them egg layers. I bet they still eat some chickens. Well, yeah, they did. But yeah. it, it wasn't primarily a, a farm to raise chickens for consumption. Okay. They, they were looking at the eggs. Okay. So in spite of everything that had happened thus far, Sanford felt reassured once the work started. He had reason to believe that things might improve now that they were finally there, because whatever Uncle Stewart's problems were, he was still a blood relative of his, and Sanford thought that should count for something. Also, Stewart needed Sanford's help at the farm, and that gave Sanford some value. And this gave Sanford hope that his uncle would stop abusing him. Unfortunately... Sanford couldn't have been more wrong about this. The first rape on the farm took place before the end of that first week there. They had already pitched their large tent and set up the home campsite, and they were moving a fresh shipment of chickens into the new wire pen. Uncle Stewart started out the attack by acting gentle, but as soon as Sanford tried to move away, he was bludgeoned to the ground and dragged into the tent. At his grandma and grandpa's place, the shock and humiliation had been overwhelming but there hadn't been any significant pain. But here in the middle of nowhere, alone on the farm, Uncle Stewart decided to sodomize Sanford, which obviously is going to be quite painful. He's screaming in pain, but no one heard him. Sanford eventually learned to keep quiet, and that would keep Stewart from beating him even more severely than he already had. Well, when Stewart left the farm, Sanford did consider running for help but it was his shame and disgust from the sexual abuse that kept him from talking to anyone. He really felt like no one would help him if they found out that he had participated in this with his uncle. Even though, of course, he had no choice, he was a victim. But the way he saw it, if he did mention any unnatural behavior, he would have to say that he had gone along with it, and then he thought no one was going to want to hear this. So at the same time, he feared that if he put his story into words, it would make it more real for him. To speak of such things would give the story additional power over him, and it would drive the listener away. He thought people would be disgusted by him, and he would be isolated. So this is what kept Sanford from getting help or thinking that he even deserved help. Now this isn't uncommon for sexual assault victims to feel guilt and at least partial responsibility. That's right. I mean, it's going to end up sort of becoming what we now know as the Stockholm Syndrome, where you identify with your captor. Yes, but I think Stuart kind of knew how to pull him in, especially when he starts abusing other kids. Yeah. To make him feel like he's part of it. He knew exactly what to do. Yeah. Well, why don't we take a quick break here for our sponsors? Okay. So if you're a fan of True Crime Brewery, you probably enjoy true crime stories, especially the ones that shine light on the darkest corners of humankind. Lurking in the shadows behind petty criminals and amateur thieves are the masterminds of the criminal world. In Kingpins, a new podcast from Parcast that I really enjoyed, they take a deep dive into the minds and the stories of the men and women who rule the crime world. Each episode looks into organized crime rings, street gangs, or mafiosos to expose how the kingpin or queenpin rose to the top and also how they eventually fall. Kingpins also reveals what kind of person is drawn into this life by using extensive research to profile them. Episodes on Frank Lucas and Richard the Iceman Kukinski are available now. New episodes come out every Friday, and one upcoming episode I'm really looking forward to is on Pablo Escobar. That's a fascinating story. So search for Kingpins where you listen to TCB. That's K-I-N-G-P-I-N-S. Or you can visit parcast.com slash kingpins to start listening today. P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com slash kingpins. So this episode is also sponsored by Madison Reed. Going to the salon can be quite a luxury, but it can also be very expensive and time-consuming. I love Madison Reed because it's a company founded by a woman who's really on a mission to revolutionize the way women color their hair. When I discovered Madison Reed, I had been getting my hair colored at the salon for years, and I honestly never thought I would color my hair at home again. Those drugstore box colors were very hit or miss, mostly miss. So it wasn't easy for me to take that leap and try Madison Reed, but I'm very happy that I did. Madison Reed really has reinvented hair color with the quality of salon color and the convenience and affordability of coloring your hair at home. Join me in getting multidimensional European hair color 
delivered to your home on your schedule for under $25. You can find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. Madison Reed is honoring our True Crime Brewery listeners with 10% off and free shipping on your first color kit with our promo code BREWERY. That's madison-reed.com and use the promo code BREWERY to get 10% off plus free shipping. And finally, I have an exciting announcement to make on behalf of Payne Lindsay and Oxygen. In a one-night special TV event, Oxygen brings to life Payne Lindsay's hit true crime podcast, Up and Vanished. In 2016, Payne took a deep dive into the disappearance of Tara Grinstead, a young teacher who went missing 13 years ago. Payne has dedicated himself to Tara's case every day, slowly unlocking the secrets her small town couldn't shake. Tara was last seen on October 21, 2005, in Osceola, Georgia. She was heading home from a barbecue and suddenly went missing. Tara's story remained a mystery for over a decade, but then Payne stepped in. His search for the truth got the town to start talking. And the Up and Vanished podcast became a national phenomenon, reaching over 240 million listeners. But the story doesn't end there because Payne is still at work, determined to find answers. So don't miss Up and Vanished, a one-night special TV event based on the hit podcast on Sunday, November 18th at 7 on Oxygen, the new network for crime. So back to the story. One night after they had arrived on the farm, Uncle Stewart's car returned and Sanford heard two voices, Uncle Stewart and somebody else. It was a boy's voice speaking broken English with a Mexican accent. So Sanford heard Uncle Stewart walk the boy over to a chicken coop. Coop was framed in two-by-fours and covered in wooden sheets. The solid wood, war, solid wood walls hid everything inside. Sanford heard the wooden door close, and he knew that Uncle Stewart was blocking the only exit. And this was the moment when the truth was clear to Sanford. The only reason for Uncle Stewart to have started up the farm was so that he had an excuse to be isolated up there. And this realization terrified him. And then he heard screams from the coop. Yeah, and I really think that his parents knew that when they bought him the farm. Yeah. At least on some level. No, there's absolutely no question. Because he'd been in trouble back in Los Angeles. He had, and he'd been in trouble in Canada before they moved to L.A. Exactly. That might have precipitated the move to Los Angeles. Absolutely. But they, they knew, his parents knew, or at least his mother for sure, knew what kind of a person he was. But she loved him, so it's really gross. Well, yeah, okay. Loved him. I'm not even using that term. Okay. Well, the little Mexican boy was screaming until his lungs were empty, and then he gasped in as much air as he could and went right back to screaming again. His third scream was choked off, and there was silence for a few moments. Sanford recognized the sounds that came next. They were from Uncle Stewart. He was in his frenzy that Sanford was familiar with. Sanford knew that the boy was being shoved face first into the dirt and raped by his Uncle Stewart but he felt helpless to do anything. The terrible noises actually caused the hens in the other coops to start squawking, and the attack seemed like it went on forever. If he cried out to Uncle Stewart in an attempt to stop this attack, he knew that it would bring Uncle Stewart back to him. So Sanford cried, but he didn't let Stewart hear him. Uncle Stewart hated crying. Sanford had learned that just a day before, when Uncle Stewart told him, if you're crying, that just means you're trying to trick somebody into letting you off easy. You're trying to duck out on your responsibility out of pity. And his uncle just seemed to be full of these ridiculous words of wisdom. He always had them. So the assaults on this kid went on inside the hen house for days. Maybe a week or more, but Sanford had lost track. One day was pretty much like the next. Guilt overtook him because of his relief at being left alone. Uncle Stewart kept to himself and ordered Sanford to keep all the farm routines going adding that he was keeping the boy bound and gagged during the daylight hours while the construction workers finished up the house. So Sanford worked on his chores alone, enough to keep him busy through the daylight hours into the night. And the labor actually was a welcome distraction. At night, Sanford would keep his sanity by tuning the noises out, but his helplessness and outrage were incredibly painful. Yeah, I really can't imagine what this boy was going through. He was completely isolated out there and And, abused. And and he's a little kid. Yeah, he's a little guy. And his family's abandoned him, right? His mom sent him out for this. 
I just can't imagine the emotional pain that would cause, not to mention all the physical pain. So I guess Sanford thought that he accidentally made it worse by being too obvious about avoiding contact with the boy, to the point that Uncle Stewart set him up to have contact with the boy. He handed Sanford an open can of beans and told him to take it out to the boy in the coop. Sanford had no idea how else to react but to go along. He had already learned that whenever Uncle Stewart was in the mood to act civilized, it gave him a moment of safety, kind of a reprieve from the abuse. So when Sanford entered the hen house that day, he saw a young Mexican boy, and his face looked like he might have been a year or two older than Sanford, but he was just as small and thin. The boy was cowered on the ground as if he was expecting another attack. In that instant, everything that Sanford had managed to push out of his thoughts, until then, sprang up before him. He was in terrible condition, the little boy, with his face disfigured by the swelling and Sanford realized that the boy was holding on to one of his arms as if it was broken. His legs were changed to a heavy post, and that was something that his uncle had added. Yeah, no escaping. No, so. but I think when the little boy saw the bruises on Sanford, he tried to get Sanford to help him escape, and Sanford did think about that. Yeah, he actually planned to help the boy escape that night. He had found a hacksaw and was waiting for his uncle Stuart to fall asleep, and he was going to try to get the chains sawed through so the kid could escape. Right. Well, he would have had to go with him, obviously, because his uncle would have beat the hell out of him. Or he would have killed him, probably. Probably. Unfortunately, Sanford fell asleep himself. Then when he woke up in the morning, Stuart's car was gone and so was the boy. Now he hoped that Stuart had taken the boy somewhere and dropped him off, and the boy would be safe. He wouldn't tell anyone what happened to him because the shame would be too great but maybe the boy would be able to live a normal life. That was Sanford's hope. Which just wasn't realistic. I mean, sadly, that wasn't going to happen. It wasn't. So boy after boy who came there, I think that his uncle killed them all. There's nothing to lead us to believe that any of them were set free. Not at all. Well, Sanford's big sister, Jessie, was worried about him after he left. She thought there was something very creepy about Uncle Stuart, and as time went on with no letters from her little brother, she wondered if he was angry with her, and he, that's why he wasn't writing. But she believed that his life at home was so bad that practically any other situation seemed better for him. I mean, she really had no idea how evil Stuart was. So Jessie kept quiet about it. But Sanford's time away from home dragged on for her, and she began to feel like she would give anything to be able to just talk to him. Now, well-off people back then would have a telephone in their homes, and some ordinary people in the city had them, but she didn't personally know anyone who had a telephone. And the problem was that even if they had a public telephone right next door, Stuart wouldn't have a telephone at his home for her to call Sanford on. So it's kind of complicated. Well, remember, this is uh, just about 100 years ago, 90 years ago. Yeah. Things sure were different. Very different, yeah. So, I mean, when you were in a, you were across the country, you were pretty much out of touch, except for letters, which took days and days to get to you. Exactly. So and that's what Stuart had Sanford do. He had him write a letter to his family back home, but Stuart dictated to Sanford what he was going to say. Uh, he was telling him he was being well taken care of and everything was fine. Now, Sanford's father found the wording to be odd, and he ended up meeting secretly with with Jesse without telling his wife, Winnie. Which was, I guess, a bold move for him, because he very rarely defied his wife. So it almost, to Jesse, that was a really brave thing her father did. It sure was. Well, I mean, to most of us, I wouldn't say that's very brave. No. He should have said to her, you know, we're not sending my son away. But I guess for him and the way things were in that family, this was a brave thing. It was unusual. So Jessie took the letter from her father, and she wrote to Sanford. When she didn't receive an answer, she decided to go and see Sanford herself to make sure that he was okay. So she had to save money. It took her a while to work up to this. And as she was working toward going to check on him, Sanford continued to suffer terrible abuse and trauma on the farm. He was knocked out by Stuart, and he woke up a few times in a dirt hole that was covered by wooden slats that were held down with heavy bricks. 
He was actually raped two to three times a week. He was burned with boiling water thrown on his back. Stewart continued to bring home young immigrants and torture them on the farm, and then they would disappear when he was done with them. Yeah, and then there was a time that Stewart returned to the farm with a bucket, and he made Sanford look inside, and Sanford was horrified to see that it was a human head. Stewart ordered Sanford to burn it down to a skull and then bash it to pieces. Yes, and it had dark hair. He thinks it was one of the young immigrants. And actually, if you read the book, uh, the Road Out of Hell, there was a lot about what Uncle Stewart would say to Sanford about getting away with murder. He talked about it quite a bit with him. He did. He's making him complicit in it. Telling him that you needed to behead them so they couldn't be identified. Telling him places where he would hide a body. It's just horrific for this kid. And that's why it's just so impressive to me that he got out of this and lived a normal life. It's unimaginable. Yeah, a pretty normal life. Yeah, I mean, he could have easily turned out being a monster like his uncle, but he didn't, not at all. No, he, he did. He had a pretty productive life. Yeah. I mean, he suffered his whole life from flashbacks and PTSD. Of course, yes. But uh, did pretty well, relatively speaking. Well, he had a family who he, said he was a great guy to them, to his did. kids. He was married for over 50 years. Now, Sanford's grandmother and grandfather would just look the other way if they happened to be visiting the, the farm while Uncle Stuart had one of his boys there. Stuart liked to pick them up and keep them around for a few days at a time. Grandma and Grandpa never questioned why the boys did no work or why there was a different one there the next time they came. Uncle Stuart's first attack on Sanford had been back in Los Angeles, and it was at night when both grandparents were home and supposedly sleeping. But they could have heard, although they never admitted it. Oh, Just, I'm pretty convinced that they did. Well, yeah. How could you not hear that? This wasn't a huge house. So, and just the same, in the same vein, they might know exactly what it meant to see Uncle Stewart's visiting workers hanging around the place. Grandpa Northcutt had stayed there overnight before the ranch house was finished, when the kid who was there at the time screamed half the night out in the hen house. At one point, Grandpa yelled out that he's trying to get some sleep. But except for that, it was never mentioned again. Well, there you go. There's your proof right there. Yeah, see? So morning came and the boy was gone and nobody talked about it. It's kind of like a dirty little secret that they're complicit in. And of course, the mother will become even more complicit. Yes. So to survive without going insane, Sanford held on to this idea that he was different from the rest of the Northcotts. And he reasoned that if he was that kind of monster... He wouldn't want to get out of there so badly as he did. Yeah, kind of that reverse logic. Exactly. Yeah. So Jesse's opinion of things was very important. In case he ever saw her again, he tried to assure himself as to why he was different from the rest of them. What he actually did was each and every little thing that Uncle Stuart told him to do. It was only after taking beatings in the beginning, but after a while, he'd stopped resisting. It was too difficult to get his work done with the aches and the stabbing pains that would follow a bad beating. And he was severely injured, and he would continue to work. Now, time passed, the abuse continued, and Sanford saw himself as a partner in the horror that went on on the farm. This realization was so powerful and devastating that Sanford abandoned the idea of trying to write a real letter to Jesse, one that would use his own words and not dictated by Uncle Stuart. There was no way for him to be able to tell Jesse enough that would get her to do something to help him without revealing things that he was sure would drive her away forever. And then we're back to the guilt there. We are. So Sanford did all of the work on the farm, and I mean all of it. And so he felt that that was his only value to Stuart, but that was how he knew that Stuart would probably keep him alive. He would make his life a living hell, but he probably wouldn't kill him because he needed him to do the work. Sanford was physically violated so often that he had nothing right with him in his rear end area. It was constantly bleeding, no matter what. And his back continually ached from the burn that Stewart had inflicted by throwing the boiling water on him. The only treatment he'd gotten for this large burn was that his uncle would put petroleum jelly on it. Now that didn't help at all. No. Not a good burn treatment. It certainly isn't. So, in fact, 
The burns seemed to get worse. It took forever to heal. Every once in a while, Uncle Stuart would force him to write another letter home, and he would go along to save himself another beating. So there were some letters going home, but they were all dictated by Uncle Stuart. Yeah, and it's all, I love this place, I'm doing well in school, I've joined the Scouts troop, I'm having a great time. Yeah, but the sister was pretty sure those weren't his words, and so was Sanford's father, although he wouldn't say much about it. Also, his writing was very rudimentary. It's not like he was continuing in school and learning anything over those years. No, his sister Jessie was pretty convinced that he wasn't attending school. Yeah. Because his handwriting looked like shit, and the diction was that of a kid that hadn't been schooled. Exactly. So in every few weeks... Stuart would disappear for a while and then return with a new Mexican boy. Each new boy lasted for about a week or so, and then Stuart would begin to see him as a liability. And by then, they they had seen too much of him. So Stuart's habit, while the new boy was there, had been to allow Sanford to stay out of sight. Sanford hustled to keep the place running, and he was glad for the chance to gain some little piece of consolation in the feeling that he was making himself indispensable while his uncle remained inside the house with the new victim. It was such a relief to be left alone, but the guilt was overwhelming, because Sanford knew another boy was suffering in his place. It's such an impossible situation. Isn't it? He cringed at the feeling of powerlessness and at his sense of cowardice, because he felt like he should have been braver, he should have done something. But the truth was that by the time the first year there had passed, Sanford had begun to take personal comfort in these terrible sounds, which made his guilt even worse, because it meant that Stuart was busy for a time. It meant that he could sleep, and most of the time, Stuart wouldn't show up to yank him out of his bed if he had another victim there. So Sanford could wake up to the roosters and not to some monster raping him in his bed. For a while he had hopes of somebody dropping by one day and overhearing what was going on, but nothing like that ever happened. Sanford did not know whether or not the devil really existed, but he really felt like his uncle was some kind of demon. Well, he was. So by the beginning of 1928, Uncle Stuart was constantly taking day-long trips, even a few overnight trips. And that March, Stuart showed up at the farm with a nine-year-old boy named Walter Collins, who was a, a little Caucasian who had been uh, reported missing by his mother in Los Angeles. Now, this was the first boy that uh, had been brought to the farm uh, who was not a Mexican immigrant. Stuart knew Walter and his mother, Christine. He'd met them both at a grocery store in Los Angeles. So this was kind of shocking to Sanford when he saw this, and he heard that the boy knew who Stuart was. Yeah, that's potentially trouble for Stuart, isn't it? Yeah, but he was so naive, Sanford was, that he thought that That meant Stuart would have to let him go. He wouldn't be able to kill this boy. But Stuart was getting more and more reckless, which criminals tend to do. The thrill, they need to do more and more to get the thrill. So Stuart had lured Walter to ride with him to the ranch by telling him that he had horses and that Walter could go riding there. But after Walter arrived, he began to feel very worried. He had a worried look on his face. Sanford believed at first that Stuart would have to let him go, because he did know his mother. But it became clear soon after that Stuart planned to rape and torture this boy, and eventually murder him as he had the other boys. The only point of restraint that Sanford had ever seen his Uncle Stuart use was the consideration of whether or not he could get away with something. But now, with Walter Collins, that last remaining restraint seemed to have been crossed. There was nothing too twisted or terrible that Stuart would not do. He just seemed to be following whatever horrible urge he had. Yes, so Sanford stayed out of the house for two days and nights, sleeping in the feed room to avoid seeing or hearing anything. He knew Walter must have been chained up inside after he saw Stuart strolling around outside, bare-chested and smoking a cigar. A big part of Sanford's survival technique was to stay too busy to think about things. And as for Walter Collins, he had no desire to see him at all. It was bad enough having to face all those boys who couldn't appeal to him in English, but it was terrible to think of him talking to a victim whose words he could actually understand. But he did end up having to do that. His uncle had him take him and wash him up 
said he was dirty, which it was mostly blood all over the boy. And he did get Sanford involved. He did. And he gets him involved even worse. Yeah. Because while Walter was still being held on the farm, who visits but Grandma Louise? So Stuart hid Walter in one of the chicken coops and had Sanford stack bags of feed along the walls to keep her from hearing Walter scream. Walter was chained to a post and gagged. But on the third day of her visit, Grandma Louise found Walter. Now Walter begged her to save him, apologizing for making Stuart angry with him. Now what she does is almost eerier than what Stuart does, because it's quite shocking to think of a grandma behaving the way she did. Now she'd apparently been covering for Stuart for years, and she referred to his child molestations as his special interests. But she really showed more concern for the possibility that Stuart might get caught than for anything else. She didn't show any empathy or concern for Walter. Louise decided that the quietest way to kill Walter was to use an axe. So she'd gone out and talked to Walter and actually kind of comforted him while he fell asleep out there, then gone in and made the plan to go out and kill him. A little boy. Yep. It's really sick. So she, Sanford, and Stuart, according to her, would each have to strike a blow on Walter so none of them could ever talk about it. So they would all be culpable. They're all guilty, so we can't squeal on the others. Right. Now, when Sanford gasped hearing this, because, okay, he knows that she's kind of a piece of shit grandmother, but he certainly didn't know that she was a murderer. How shocking is that? So what kind of boy are you, she said to him, that you don't understand the bond between a mother and her son? So she was going to kill this boy for Stuart, to save Stuart. That's right. So Louise, Grandma Louise, said she would strike Walter first. It would be an act of mercy for the poor child, she said. Then Sanford would hit him, whether he was dead or not, followed by Uncle Stuart. Sanford cried and refused, but then Uncle Stuart threw a smaller axe at him, which cut his arm. So Sanford hit Walter with the dull side of the axe after Louise and Stuart had struck and killed him. Then the two adults supervised as Sanford dug a hole for Walter's body. So as soon as the remains of Walter Collins were dropped into the hole, Sanford was left there alone to fill up the grave and pack down the dirt. This was while Uncle Stuart drove Grandma Louise back to town. We can trust you now, Sanford, Uncle Stuart told him as they were leaving. Now you're really part of the family. Yeah, it's really horrific. And a similar thing happened that May when Stuart brought home two brothers, Nelson and Louis Winslow, who were 10 and 12. They had gone missing while walking home from a model yacht club meeting and Stuart brought the boys out to the farm, they became his latest victims. By Sanford's best estimate, Stuart had killed nearly 20 boys since they first moved onto the ranch. How many boys had died before that was unknown, but Sanford did wonder why his grandparents had moved out of Canada. In totaling up the figure on the ranch victims, he forced himself to go back to the beginning, back to those first few months when he had believed that Stuart supposedly was taking these boys someplace where he would drop them off. So he did make Sanford participate in the killing of Nelson and Louis Winslow as well. He did. And he did. it's just so sad what these boys went through when they got there and found out what their fate was. Terrific. Oh, it's just horrible. Now, in August of 1928, Sanford's sister Jessie finally visited. Sanford was 15 by this time. Jessie was certainly concerned about his welfare. The letters she had received from him didn't seem to be his own words, and his writing had not improved at all, so she thought that he wasn't going to school. Yeah, I think she was pretty sure that something was wrong. Oh, she knew. She didn't know how wrong at all, though. I think she was quite shocked to find out how bad it really was. Exactly. I mean, no one would even imagine that it was that bad. Well, it's beyond belief, actually. It is. It really is. So Sanford was so terrified with Jesse at the farm because he is certain that if she found out what was going on, Stuart was going to kill her. Yeah, I just can't imagine how scary that would be. But he, he knows that his sister's there and that this guy's a murderer. So he knows that her life's in danger and she doesn't. It's a terrible position that this kid was in. Horrible. So it took some time, but Jesse finally convinced Sanford to confide in her 
and he told her that he was really fearing for his life there. And one night while Stuart was asleep, Sanford told her that Stuart had killed at least four boys at his ranch. Jesse returned to Canada about one week after this discovery, and Sanford promised that he would come up right behind her. Once in Canada, Jesse informed the American consul there about Stuart Northcott's crimes. And they wrote a letter to the Los Angeles Police Department detailing Jesse Clark's sworn complaint. So on August 31, 1928, two United States Immigration Service inspectors visited the chicken ranch in Wineville. And they found 15-year-old Sanford at the ranch, and they took him into custody. Now, Stewart had seen the agents driving up the long road to the ranch, and before fleeing into the trees, he told Sanford to stall the agents or he's going to shoot him with a gun, with his rifle. During the next two hours, while Sanford did stall them, Stewart kept on running. Finally, when Sanford did feel that the agents could protect him, he told them that Stewart had taken off into the trees off the edge of his chicken ranch property. Stewart actually had fled to Los Angeles, and he and his mother went from there to Canada. But they were arrested near, Ver near Vernon, British Columbia, on September 19, 1928. Stewart confessed to killing more than five boys, while his mother pleaded guilty to killing Walter Collins. Stewart allegedly, at this point, had killed over 20 boys, but the state of California did not have enough evidence to indict him of those killings. They were only able to charge him with the two cases of the Winslow brothers and the headless Mexican. So Sanford did testify at the sentencing of Louise Northcott that his uncle, Gordon Stewart Northcott, had kidnapped, molested, beaten, and killed three young boys with help from his mother and from Sanford himself. Sanford also testified about the murder of a fourth boy, a Mexican, where Stewart had forced Sanford to help dispose of that head in the bucket by burning it in the fire pit and breaking the skull to pieces. Stewart stated that he left the headless body by the side of the road near Puente, California, because he had no other place to put it. Sanford also said that quicklime was used to dispose of the remains and that the bodies of Lewis and Nelson Winslow and of Walter Collins were actually buried on the Wineville Chicken Ranch. At the ranch house, authorities also found a Pomona Public Library book that was checked out to one of the Winslow brothers, some clothing that would be identified as theirs, and a note that one of them had written to their parents, saying, don't worry, we are fine. So how sad is that? Incredible. It's just heartbreaking. Then in December 1928, three months after his arrest, Stewart was taken to the chicken ranch in handcuffs. Police reported that he initially said nine boys had been killed there, but he admitted to killing only five. In a written confession that day, he owned up to just one, believed to be a Mexican ranch hand. I killed Alvin Gothea on the ranch on February 2, 1928. No self-defense. Gordon Stewart Northcutt will plead guilty to the above charge in Riverside County tomorrow. Because he actually decided to be his own lawyer, right? Right. Yeah. So he was sentenced to death in February of 1929, and he was hanged in October 1930. It's remarkable to me that he was only 23. So he started so young. Just makes me feel like he was evil from the get-go. When he took Sanford, he was only 20 or 21 years old. Correct. And this behavior had been going on for some time. Definitely. So. Yeah. Well, actually, due to all this negative publicity that Wineville received, the city changed its name in 1930 to Mira Loma. Yeah, Wineville Avenue, Wineville Road, and Wineville Park are the only remaining references of the community. So you can find out more about this series of murders um, in an episode of Criminal Minds and in the book we talked about called The Road Out of Hell, written by Anthony Flacco, along with Sanford's son, Jerry Clark. There's the movie The Changeling with Angelina Jolie, and that's about Walter Collins going missing and this other boy that the police tell Christine Collins is her son, even though she knows it's not. Yeah, and, and we don't find the reference or, or the connection to the chicken farm until the very end of the movie. Right, so they really don't talk much about that in the movie. I right. was surprised. 
the only, I guess, uplifting thing here is the way Sanford managed to pull himself up and live a good life. Yeah. Because he had so much guilt and such low self-esteem, and he had a lot of difficulty trusting people. Well, Jesus, yeah. No kidding. How could he not have difficulty trusting people after that? I mean, it's not only what his uncle did to him. His parents let him down in such a big way. All the adults. Yeah, the grandparents. That he knew. Yeah. Everyone except his sister, who didn't have that much power. One thing we, we didn't talk too much about, but in the book there's a prosecutor named Loyal Kelly. We didn't talk about that at all. But he was a person who had a tremendous influence over Sanford and probably was instrumental in helping him survive. And not only survive, but be a good member of the community. Yeah. Well, he actually was put into some kind of boarding school for troubled kids, but it was very progressive. Yeah. And he was rehabilitated. He actually got therapy. He did. Instead of just keeping them locked up. Mm-hmm. And I guess he had uh, Kelly to thank a lot for that. And he really looked up to him. He did. And he worked hard not to disappoint him. Right. He's probably the first man to treat him with kindness and have any faith in him. I think at first he was just surprised that anyone would be nice to him. That's how sad it is. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. So a sad case, like I said, but really inspiring how Sanford Clark was able to rehabilitate and get away from there and actually function. I mean, any functioning at all as an adult after that is commendable to me. Wow. I mean, I'm, I'm reading this and I'm thinking, how could he possibly be any kind of a member of society? Oh, yeah, I think I'd collapse into alcoholism yeah. and drugs if I had that life. But he managed to pull through. He did. And they do comment in the book that there's several times, many times, of his PTSD causing him to be debilitated. But his wife and his sister, who lived not too far from him, always knew how to help him through it. Yeah, I guess it's similar to someone who's been in a war. Oh, yeah. Very similar. So, good horrible episode. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I really do recommend the book if you want to find out more about this, because that's really the only reference that kind of gave us a feel for where Sanford was coming from. It was all from Sanford's point of view. So we have to give credit here to Anthony Flacco and Jerry Clark for that. The music for this podcast was written and produced by Tristan Capel. And if you enjoy True Crime Brewery and would like to offer support and gain access to members-only episodes each month, please go to our website, tigrabber.com, and join Team Tigrabber. You can also go to Patreon and become a patron. Tigrabber members also receive gifts from us, as well as our endless admiration and devotion. We also appreciate getting voicemails or emails with case suggestions. And until the end of the year, people who get their voicemails played on an episode get a free t-shirt. So how's that? I already noticed an uptick on yeah. voicemails. It's funny what a little bribery can do. I'll tell you. Yep. So before we get into your feedback, let me remind you that Payne Lindsay's hit true crime podcast, Up and Vanished, is coming to life in a one-night special TV event on Oxygen. Two years ago, Payne began exploring the shocking disappearance of a young teacher and former beauty queen named Tara Grinstead, who vanished over a decade earlier and Payne is still at work searching for the truth. Don't miss Up and Vanished, a one-night special TV event on Sunday, November 18th at 7 on Oxygen. And I'm not getting paid for saying this part, but I really think that Oxygen has stepped up their game in true crime. I really enjoy the ID channel, but it seems like most of the best true crime TV specials have been on Oxygen, including that recent one on the disappearance of Phoenix Colden, that was really riveting. I enjoyed that a lot. Yeah, so I have high hopes for this Up and Vanished. Okay, let's get on to feedback. Let's do some feedback. So we got voicemails first. Okay. And, and first up is Levy. Levy. Let's listen to what Levy had to say. She has a comment on Paolo Maccherini. Okay, so that's our most recent episode called Bad Medicine. That's it. All right, let's listen. It's too hard. But your promise of a True Crime Brewery t-shirt 
size large. Thank you very much. Motivated me to do it today. Also, Bad Medicine, I was listening to that and I knew this was the episode I should call in on because being a whistleblower is really, really hard. And this Paolo, Paolo jerk really deserves jail time. <laughs> I agree with you, Jill. I hope he goes to jail. But I wanted to spend time talking about the whistleblowers in this story because I know firsthand how hard that is. I worked in a university lab for years, a couple years between my undergraduate and my graduate degree and had to sit in on a couple of meetings with whistleblowers. One was the principal investigator I worked for had found some aberrations in some colleagues' data. And another one was um, my own husband had some conflicting issues in, a, I don't want to say too much, you know, I want to keep confidentiality there. So, but he had some issues too. And so both people ended up being whistleblowers, but I know firsthand how much they labored over that decision and how hard it was for them and how afraid they were that they were doing the wrong thing, not the right thing, that they were wrong. So I wanted you to maybe address whistleblowing in your post-show commentary and, and maybe talk about how hard it is and and maybe give people some pointers and tips on things that relate to whistleblowing, like how to know if you need to blow a whistle, you know, how to protect yourself. In both cases that I was in, the university I worked at had a anonymous whistleblower line, and that was really helpful, especially for my partner. He ended up using that. And for the PI, you know, it's a little less easy to use a whistleblowing anonymous line because their credibility is needed sometimes. But there are certainly protections for whistleblowers. And I think it's a topic worth going into a little more detail on. And maybe you could do some other cases where whistleblowing is a relevant factor. I don't have any case suggestions. I just wanted to leave a quick voicemail, let you know that you guys are still one of my favorite true crime podcasts after all these years since Serial first came out. I still really, really go to you guys first, and I appreciate all your in-depth research and your intellectual analysis. And Jill, I wanted to give you a voicemail, particularly because... Oh, we got cut off. Oh, what did she you She ran out of her three minutes. Oh, sorry, Livy. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Livy, though. Great voicemail. It was. So, let's just talk about whistleblowers. Sure. Right? And we know that in regards to the Maccherini case... There were four people that were considered whistleblowers, and they suffered a lot of consequences. Nobody believed them, basically, at the Institute. They were vilified. One was even accused of research fraud by Macchiarini, or not fraud, stealing data. And uh, I think one lost his job, a couple quit. I mean, this is horrible. Sure. So let's see, a whistleblower would be considered a person who exposes any kind of information or activity that might be deemed illegal, unethical, or not correct within an organization that may be private or public. So this information of alleged wrongdoing could be looked at as a violation of company policy or rules, a violation of law, of regulation, or a threat to the public interest or national security, and even fraud and corruption. So if you find this and become a whistleblower, you can report it internally, where you bring your accusations to the attention of people within the organization, like an immediate supervisor. Well, and don't most establishments have kind of a chain they that you're supposed to follow? Clear rules, yes. But legally, you don't have to follow that. No. You could go right to external if you feel like you need to. And then external, I mean, you can just contact a newspaper or some other media. Now, they take a risk. Uh, facing stiff reprisal and retaliation, obviously, right. from those accused or alleged of wrongdoing. Well, especially if that one is really, someone is really looked up to in a, like Paolo was, then nobody's going to want to believe you. And like you said, he turned around and accused one of them of stealing some of his data. There are laws that exist to protect whistleblowers. Some work better than others. And they, they end up having varying results. What we do know is whistleblowing in the public sector organization is more likely to result in criminal charges. A whistleblower who chooses to accuse a private sector organization is more likely to face termination in legal and civil charges. 
So it's really a brave thing to do because you do face some really scary things. Exactly. So some people feel that whistleblowing is an ethical thing, maintains that whistleblowing is a form of civil disobedience and aims to protect the public from wrongdoing. Then on the opposite side, whistleblowers are unethical because they breach confidentiality. Well, that's like when you have a non-disclosure agreement. Right. But sometimes you have to. Yeah, now there are lots of laws that grant protection to whistleblowers, but there are stipulations that can easily cloud that protection and leave whistleblowers vulnerable to retaliation and legal trouble. So they frequently face reprisal, sometimes by the people they've accused, sometimes from related organizations, and sometimes the law. Well, it can be a real career killer. You have to be really sure of yourself. Yeah, and I think that most whistleblowers are. Most people aren't going to go to these lengths unless they really feel they have a moral responsibility. I guess the, the end result is that it ain't easy. <laughs> right. Well, whistleblowing is really a big part, um, if you've ever taken an ethics class, it's a big part of that. It's a fascinating topic, really. It is. Yep, but this is a true crime show, so let's move on to the next voicemail. Yeah, thanks, Libby. So the next one is a case suggestion from Chelsea. Okay, Chelsea's been, uh, I think she's called in before. Let's hear what she has to say. Hi, Jill and Dick. This is Chelsea again calling from Bellingham. I just listened to your newest episode and heard about the incentive. I did call back maybe a month or two ago, and you guys played my voicemail then. I was going to send you guys an email, but since Jill has offered a lovely t-shirt for those that get played on the podcast, I figured I would call in. I had another case suggestion for you, again from uh, my home state in Alaska. This one's involving uh, the murder of Samantha Koenig by Israel Keys. Samantha Koenig was abducted um, from one of those drive through coffee stands in Anchorage, Alaska in, I believe it was the spring of 2013. And there was a pretty significant search for her and there was and Israel had like requested ransom fees all over like and used her debit card and was out of the state down in the southwest it sounded like anyhow there's a lot of details about this case that I find fascinating including the fact that once they did apprehend the gentleman that killed her and found out who he was through his use of her debit card that they found out that he had been a serial killer and had killed several other people throughout the United States as well. And I think even to this day, they don't know who they believe that he'd killed other people that he never confessed to. Unfortunately, after a short period of time in jail in Anchorage, he did commit suicide. So there is a lot of unknowns about him and, um, if there were potentially all these other murders. But there were some uh, other confirmed murders, I believe, on the East Coast and in the state of Washington. I'd have to do more research to be positive about that. That being said, um, my timer's going here. I just wanted to say, again, a lot of great beers in Alaska. Moose's Tooth has some fantastic beers. I love, like, their apple, which is pretty sweet. Might not be either of your your tastes. And, but it's one of my favorite beers. I have to get one every time I visit home. I, but that's pretty much it. So I hope you guys have a fantastic week and thanks for listening to my voicemail. I appreciate all you do. Once again, thanks. Bye bye. Thanks, Chelsea. Yeah. So you included this voicemail because this is a case you're interested in. This is. Uh, this guy, Keys, started uh, violent crimes as early as when he was like 17, 18 years old. And his first was of a violent sexual assault of a teenage girl in Oregon. Now, he was a fairly prolific rapist and murderer. As Chelsea said, he was captured in 2012 for the murder, abduction and murder of Samantha Koenig. He admitted to these crimes while in in prison. And then before he went to trial, he killed himself. So that's what interested me. I mean, it's it's almost like he was kind of, I don't want to say relieved, but he he had this 15, 15, almost 20-year crime spree. He gets caught. He confesses to doing a lot of other things and kills himself. It's like he got it off his chest and boom. But I I thought that was interesting. All right. So you're going to research that one some more? I'm going to check it out. Okay. All right. And thank you for the beer suggestions. Yeah. Do you have any comments on the beers? I forgot about that. I haven't had too many Alaska beers. Alaska Brewing Company, I think. 
a few of them. And what's the one, the, the devil's, some barley wine that I've had that is a killer. It's a strong one. A strong one. Yeah, we might have to take a trip. I've never been to Alaska, so okay. keep that in mind. We'll do that. Okay, I have a case suggestion voicemail from Katie. Last voicemail for today. Hi, Dick and Jill. My name is Katie. I live here in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and I just wanted to call and tell you guys how much I absolutely love your podcast. I've been listening to it for about six months. I have binged it, so I've listened to every episode I possibly can. I love the style of your podcast. I am a nurse, and so I absolutely just can't tell you how much I enjoy all of the medical um, explanation and um, medical parts that you put into the stories. It's just very fascinating to me. Uh, I also love beer, so I guess that might be another reason I love it. I love all the beer um, suggestions. But I did have a case I wanted to suggest to you guys. It is one that took place here in Colorado Springs, um, and it was the case of Heather Dawn Church. She was a 13-year-old girl who was abducted from her home while she was babysitting her five-year-old sibling. They later found her skull. About three years later, they found her skull about 30 miles from her house. They did have a lot of suspects um, during the investigation, one being even her, one was even her father, because uh, he had been separated from her mom at the time of the abduction. And, um, but they did have a fingerprint that was lifted from one of the screens in the house. And that led them to um, Robert Charles Brown. He, um, his fingerprint was found because he had a motor vehicle theft in Louisiana and was convicted of that. And that's how they got the match. They did find that he was living in a motor home in the Colorado Springs area during the time of the murder and abduction of Heather. So they were able to bring him in and during the interrogation, it was a little difficult, but they finally got him to confess to the murder. Um, he pled guilty and was, you know, put in jail. And then after that, it, things got pretty interesting because he then wrote a letter confessing to, I believe it was 49 more murders, um, 48 more women that he killed in nine different states and, and one in South Korea. So um, it's pretty interesting. I haven't ever looked into if they did any more investigating to connect him to any of these women, if they were able to find any more of his victims. Um, but I think it might be an interesting thing to kind of dig deeper into since I have never heard. So um, I appreciate what you guys do. I just absolutely love it. And um, keep up the good work because we, there's so many of us out here who love listening to it every Tuesday. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. That was nice. Yeah. Now, I chose this one just because it was kind of similar to the Israel Keys one in that they catch this guy for the murder. And while he's in prison, he starts talking and he starts talking about all these other people he's killed. Brown was arrested in March of 1995, charged with killing Heather Dawn Church, who was 13 at the time. Now, he initially pled not guilty, but he changed his plea to guilty so that prosecutors would not seek the death penalty. And in a similar plea agreement, he confessed to the death of a 15-year-old child eight years earlier in an apartment complex, and that child's body has never been recovered. Then in this confession, he admitted to murdering up to 48 other people in a period spanning from 1970 until his arrest. Now, did the police believe that, or was he exaggerating? I mean, usually well, the police have an idea. There, it's, it's a difficult one. I need to do some more research. I, I think they're skeptical. Well, I mean, 48 people. I barely know 48 people. <laughs> a lot of people. Yeah, but this is a 25-year uh, period, right? And were these mostly young girls? Yeah. Oh, awful. Think of all the parents affected by that, huh? Yeah, he sent, terrible. he sent a letter to authorities you know, around the year 2000, and it said, Seven sacred virgins entombed side by side. Those less worthy are scattered wide. The score is you won the other team 48. And this letter included a hand-drawn map with outlines of Colorado, Washington, California, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Mississippi with a number written inside each state. How gross. So I think that'd be an interesting one to check into, and I plan on doing it. Well, I wonder if police are still investigating this because there must be some unsolved murders that they're connecting to this. Right. Or some disappearances, right, that or, they've never found. 
you got it. Yeah. So I'm going to look into that. It sounded really interesting. Okay. All right. Now on to the emails. We have an email from Lynn that's a case suggestion. And Lynn says, I come from a rural area in Georgia, and in 1997, there was a horrible murder of an entire family that left everyone shocked. For context, this is a county where everybody knows everybody. It is safe and quiet, so this was very, very unexpected. I'd like to suggest that you please do an episode on the Santa Claus murders in Santa Claus, Georgia. I would love to hear your take on it. Thank you. So, is this um, something we should do on Christmas? Well, I don't know about Christmas. I mean, it's, it's I'm just, joking. I'm just joking. Just kind of a weird name town. Yeah, and, I and never I, knew there was a town named that. No. And the, the streets are named after reindeers and stuff like that. Oh, uh, that should be in a Hallmark movie, not in a murder case. Well, just briefly, this uh, Georgia couple back in 1997, this couple who cared for foster children, were found shot to death in their home with two of the kids. And I think the two kids that had been killed were their kids, not the foster kids. Biological. Biological kids. Thank you. Three other kids were kidnapped by the assailant. They were released unharmed. Well, I wonder why that would be. That's strange. Why Isn't would it? you kill two and then, unless there's some kind of vendetta against that family personally, you know? Possibly. Uh, there were two other children that were left at home that were unharmed. Wow, they had a lot of kids there. Yeah. I think there were three or four foster children and three or four of their children. So there's a good possibility that these were really good people trying to do something positive in the world. Yeah. So the, the person who was arrested is a guy named Jerry Scott Heidler, and he had lived with the couple briefly while he was trying to overcome drug and alcohol problems. So he was charged with the murders, and I didn't get too much into that, and then he has been convicted of the murders and sentenced to death, and I don't know if he's still on death row or he's still alive, so I figured I'd look at that a little more closely. Okay. Gee, that kind of makes me think of the Green Mile, where those two little girls were killed by the guy that was working on the farm and living with the family. Exactly. Okay, we have another case suggestion from Corey and Kelly, and this is edited a bit. It says, We are husband and wife who listen to every TCB podcast. You guys are just wonderful, etc., etc. <laughs> the first is the case of prostitute Robin Benedict, murdered by Tufts professor William Douglas, married with three children, which involves Robin, a hopeful student at the Rhode Island School of Design, and William Douglas, Tufts professor, embezzling funds to pay for his dirty little secret rooted in Boston's combat zone. The combat zone was Robin's final career choice after only two courses at the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, Rhode Island. Robin Benedict met her demise at the hands of William Douglas's obsession. This case is seedy and just carnally driven, with no thought of the consequences for any parties involved. So you have some information on this, or you want me to read what you've written down? You can, you can read what I wrote down, because it's, it's pretty interesting. I vaguely remembered it, but then I said, you know, I, I hadn't moved back to New England at that point, so, but I, I sort of heard about it. So a Tufts professor. That's unusual. Yeah, I mean, this is amazing. So it was 1983 when 21-year-old Robin Benedict was brutally murdered by the former Tufts professor, William Douglas. He confessed to striking her in the head with a two-and-a-half-pound sledgehammer, dumping their bloodstained clothes in a trash barrel, and discarding her body in a dumpster and then abandoning her car. Robin Benedict was a prostitute, and what makes this murder noteworthy is that it was one of the first cases in modern history to use a strategy of essentially blaming the victim for the crime in the court of public opinion. The denigrating nickname in the press at the time was the prostitute and the professor case. Yeah, that's really lousy. I don't like that. Yeah, that's, that's why I included this. It, yeah. it just sounded pretty interesting. Well, in April 1982, Benedict met Douglas at Good Time Charlie's on LaGrange Street in Boston's infamous former burlesque area, known as the Combat Zone. By the summer of 1982, Douglas was seeing Robin nearly every day and paid her $100 per hour when they were together. Then it was found out that he embezzled more than $67,000 in total from Tufts to pay for this relationship and lifestyle. Wow. No kidding. That does seem like a very seedy story that I would like to cover. You know, I like the seedy ones. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought it was good. And they... they uh... Corey and Kelly, the couple who listened to us, have another case that we'll talk about in next week's feedback. 
Okay. That's also an interesting one. All right. So we're doling it out. We're doling it out. But I, I like the letter. And, and these people live in South Carolina, outside of Columbia. So I put that in because Columbia is near and dear to my heart. I see. Seeing as how it's my first job. Right. When I finished training. And they also said some really nice stuff to us about the podcast, well, I, which I appreciate. I didn't even, even though... look at that. That had nothing to do with it. <laughs> okay. All right. But yeah, I, it's uh, sound like a nice couple. Yeah. And it brought back fond memories. Okay. University of South Carolina. Go sure. Cox. Okay. I think they need to change the name. They do. All right. Well, that wraps it up, Dickie. Do you have anything else you'd like to add this week? This week, I'm done. You're doing a great job. You're really killing it with the feedback. <laughs> Thank you. I'm really I'm happy blushing. you took it over. I'm blushing. And everybody's killing it with the voicemails. Yeah, keep those coming, right? Yeah, it's great. Until we run out of t-shirts. Well, we won't do that. All right. So thank you so much for listening today, and we will see you next time at the quiet end. We'll save a seat for you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. 